Come to uh, our Bible reading, the, the one we're going to look at today, which is uh, Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 to 10. The words are up on the screen, or feel free to follow along in your Bible. Now after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, Come quickly to the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee, where you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly for the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Amen. Well, uh, before we dive into the text, let's uh, have a quick word of prayer. Uh, Lord, we pray that you will open our, our ears to your, to, to, to your words uh, and be able to understand uh, what, we, what we hear and be able to put it into practice in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, let's go. The world is broken, isn't it? I'm sure most of you uh, would not disagree with that statement. Uh, and if you don't agree, you just have to look at the uh, list of the top 10 worst things that happened in 2023. That's just uh, the first two. Here's the first five on the list. There's the, the October Hamas attack on Israel. There's the Russian invasion of Ukraine that still continues. There's the toxic chemical explosion uh, in East Palestine, Ohio, the Hawaiian wildfires, the Titan submersible sub-incident. That's only the first five. There's a few more, and, and some of those I'd even forgotten had happened. But this world is broken, and we're all searching for someone who can help us mend it. That's why we find ourselves drawn to individuals or organisations who exude confidence in their ability to bring about change. Uh, you know, whether it's Andrew Tate, Jordan Peterson, Greenpeace, Just Stop Oil, uh, Trump, Biden, anyone else you can think of, there's always someone in that space claiming that they are the solution. They urge us to listen to them, to support them, to financially support them, to vote for them, uh, and more, promising that they can fix things if we just follow their lead. But on Friday... Damon told us that the only solution to this issue of the world being broken was Jesus, or is Jesus. It's the reason he came to this earth and the reason he lived as one of us. Uh, we looked at Matthew 11, where John the Baptist sent his disciples to ask Jesus. They, uh, they came to Jesus and they said, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised up. And the poor have good news preached to them. That's not fixing a broken world. I don't know what is. Jesus came to repair our broken world. And his ultimate act in his mission was to sacrifice himself on the cross for the sins of his people. Because sin is the root cause of all this. All this brokenness. Not only did he die, but he rose again from the dead. And that's what we celebrate today. Easter Sunday, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And the resurrection is the foundation of our faith as Christians. Jesus was raised as king and leader of a better world. And Christians call this better world the kingdom of God or just the kingdom and although Jesus' kingdom has entered into our broken world, it's not yet fully established. Uh, soon Jesus will return uh, and finish what he started. Uh, he started it by his resurrection. And uh, at that time, we will 
have an unbroken, perfect world to live in with unbroken, perfect bodies as well. Uh, today, I'd just like to talk about three benefits of being in Jesus' kingdom. And one of the greatest benefits is the hope we have for a brighter future, thanks to his resurrection. So here's the three benefits. I'll get them uh, out of the way, and then we'll talk about them. Uh, so because Jesus is risen, we can have forgiveness of past sins. We can have power for present living, and we can have hope for future destiny. So if you've got your Bibles with you, uh, open them up to our passage, Matthew chapter 28. And we read, Now after the Sabbath, towards dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, and he came and he rolled back the stone and he sat on it. And his appearance was like lightning, his clothing as white as snow, and for fear of him the guards trembled and became like dead men. So when these women came to visit the tomb, they were not expecting an earthquake or the presence of an angel. Other Gospels actually suggest that their main worry was how they would manage to remove the stone, roll away the stone that was blocking the tomb's entrance so they could access Jesus. And if we see Jesus as merely dying on the cross and being buried in a tomb, there's no hope. There's no forgiveness for us. It's the resurrection that gives us assurance that Jesus has overcome death and won the victory for his people. It's the resurrection that makes all the difference and puts us right with God. Uh, the Bible says that uh, because of our sins, Jesus was handed over to die and he was raised to life in order to put us right with God. That's Romans 4.25. Uh, I think we've all heard of the Battle of Waterloo, uh, not the Abbasong, but the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, in June 1815, it, it was all over, uh, and England was waiting for news of the outcome of that campaign. Now, the Duke of Wellington, who had opposed Napoleon Bonaparte uh, in this battle, uh, was on his way home, and this was long before telegraph, telephones, television, tele whatever. Uh, that they had watchers stationed along the shore of the coast to read the semaphore, so they spoke by flags, signalling. They were waiting for the signals from the first returning sailing ships. It was a cloudy and foggy day, but finally one watcher spied a sailing vessel and it began to signal the message. And the message read, Wellington defeated. And then the fog closed in again. And this message was relayed across all of England, and the nation was gripped in by discouragement and defeat. Hours later, however, the fog lifted and the entire message came through. Wellington defeated the enemy. Discouragement was banished and the nation rejoiced at the good news. I think this story perfectly illustrates the state of mind that the disciples and, and those women were in when Jesus died because Jesus made some very... Uh, outlandish claims, some very big claims. He said that uh, he had come to seek and save the lost, and he gave his life as a ransom for many. He said that he had come so that people might have life and have it to the full. And he said whoever was thirsty, spiritually thirsty, could come to him and be refreshed. He said that whoever would follow him would never walk in darkness, but would have the light of life. He also said that he had come to give eternal life to his people. Uh, but then he was crucified. Jesus died and his body was buried in the tomb of another man. And so you could say that the message that rang out into the world on that day was Jesus defeated. Jesus defeated. And all the disciples were gripped by discouragement and defeat. But then... Three days later, on Easter morning, came the resurrection. Uh, Matthew 28, 5 says, But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know what you seek, that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. 
Three days after Jesus was buried, he rose. He rose physically and bodily from the grave. It took three days, but the entire message came through. Jesus defeated the enemy. And the discouragement of the disciples was dispelled. And they rejoiced at the good news. Jesus had conquered sin and death and hell. He would conquered Satan and sin as well. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the penalty for our sin. When he died, he defeated Satan. On, and on the cross, he conquered our enemy. The resurrection was God's stamp of approval. The resurrection was God saying, Jesus, I accept your death as a substitute for guilty sinners. The resurrection was God's proof that Jesus did the job he was sent earth on earth to do. The resurrection is proof that his work is completed. And because of the resurrection of Jesus, we can be confident that Jesus paid the penalty for all the sins of his people. The resurrection proves that his death covers every single sin. Not one single sin has been omitted. And because of Jesus' resurrection, we can be confident that God forgave all our sins. Now, some people may find uh, this offensive, but there is no other way to heaven except through Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Um, the Bible says salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given by men to which we must be saved. That's Acts 4.12. I forgot the slide for that one. Jesus paid the penalty for sin. Now, his resurrection proved that God accepted his death as a sufficient payment for sin. And the resurrection guarantees that God will forgive our sin if we sincerely and wholeheartedly cry out to him for forgiveness. So the first benefit of being in Jesus' kingdom is that Jesus' resurrection shows we have forgiveness for our past sins and there is nothing that we have done that cannot be forgiven. Now, the second benefit of being in Jesus' kingdom is having power for present living. And the resurrection of Jesus not only guarantees forgiveness of past sins, it also guarantees us power for present daily living because Jesus is our living saviour. He's a saviour who is able to empower us to live each day for him. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippines, uh, Philippians, he said, uh, I can do any, everything through him who gives me strength. Because of Jesus' resurrection, the Apostle Paul affirmed that he has power for daily living. Now, there's a, there's a story, I don't know if it's true or not, but it tells of a Muslim and a Christian sitting down together, having a chat, and uh, the Muslim says, you know, we Muslims have one thing you Christians don't have. When we go to Medina, we find a coffin, and we know that Muhammad lived because his body is in it. But when you Christians, you go to Jerusalem, you find nothing but an empty tomb. Thank you, exclaimed the Christian. What you say is absolutely true. And that makes the eternal difference. The reason we find an empty tomb is because we serve a risen Christ. Now, there's plenty of historical evidence to, to prove that Jesus rose. Uh, and it's not a myth or a story. And we know this from an empty tomb, from the people Christ, who saw Christ physically alive. First those two women, uh, then the apostles, then over 500 people saw Christ alive after he rose from the dead. Jesus is the only man in history to rise from the dead. No other great religious teachers ever rose from the dead. Uh, the Jewish father Abraham, he died. Uh, uh, 483 BC, uh, the Buddhists say uh, that that was the time Buddha died. Uh, 632 AD, Muhammad died. Uh, and in 33 AD, Jesus died. But he came back to life. And he appeared to over 500 people in 40 days. Who do you think you can trust? Only Jesus. And that should be cause for great celebration. Uh, that God, the God that we worship and serve is alive. 
and that should make the difference in our attitude as well. Uh, every day our lives can be full of hope, can be full of courage, can be full of excitement, can be full of praise and thanksgiving. Because the tomb is empty, we can have lives full of Christ as the Holy Spirit dwells within us. And because the tomb is empty, not only have, do we have forgiveness of our sins, but we also have power to help us in our daily lives. Uh, listen to what the author of Hebrews uh, puts in his letter. Um, he says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus is alive, and so he is able to help us in our time of need. Jesus' resurrection guarantees uh, power for daily living. Yep. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. That's, so no matter what difficulty, no matter what trial, no matter what hardship, Jesus empowers us, his people, for daily living so that we can say with the Apostle Paul, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Finally, the uh, third benefit of being part of the kingdom of, God, uh, the kingdom of Christ is hope. Hope for a future destiny. The resurrection guarantees forgiveness from past sins. It guarantees power for the present living. It also guarantees us hope for our future destiny. The resurrection guarantees... Uh, uh, yeah, let's have a look at this passage, uh, the last part of our passage today. The angel says to the women, go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. And behold, he's going before you to Galilee where you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. They came and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Jesus not only appears to these two ladies, but he promises to appear before all his disciples. Soon they will also see the risen God, the risen Lord. The Apostle Paul said in Corinthians, by his power, God raised Jesus from the dead and he will raise us also. That is our future hope. What a magnificent promise that is. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead will one day raise believers back to life as well. Uh, Jesus said to his disciples uh, in John 14, uh, just before he was crucified, he said, don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust in me also. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would not have told you. Uh, I am going there to prepare a place for you. So right now, Jesus is preparing a place for us in heaven, for every single Christian. Uh, unfortunately, he's not preparing a place for Muslims. He's not preparing a place for Buddhists or Hindus or animists or atheists or any type of unbeliever. He's preparing a place for those who trust in him with a real life, uh, live, vital faith. And one day, those of us who wholeheartedly believe in Jesus will die and go to be with him and live with him in heaven for all eternity. Just to have a look at the responses, the different responses to the angel between the women and the guards. While both the women and the guards respond to the angel's appearance with fear, the guards' fear induce, induce a death-like state and eventual denial. Whereas the women's fear and awe is mingled with uh, and give way to hope and joy and worship. So as we can see, there's two ways to respond to Jesus. There's the way of courage and faith, which leads to worship. Then there's the way of rejection, which leads to deceit upon deceit. Now, a little over a month before he died, the renowned atheist and philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre 
uh, expressed his unwavering resistance to feelings of despair. He would affirm to himself, he would say, I know I shall die in hope. However, in moments of profound sadness, he would also add, but hope needs a foundation. Now, this reminds us that even in the face of death, hope finds its strength when it's anchored upon a solid foundation. And the resurrection of Jesus is that foundation of all Christian hope. This is the hope that the resurrection gives to those of us who knows Jesus personally as their Lord and Saviour. We'll be raised back to life. We'll find ourselves at home with Jesus in heaven for all eternity. Now, um, my family visited Japan several years ago, so uh, while I was checking uh, up about tourist attractions there, I stumbled upon this. In the, the little Japanese town of Shingo, there's a local legend that claims it has the final resting place of the real Jesus Christ. According to this legend, Jesus didn't die on the cross at Golgotha. Instead, his brother Isakuri died on the cross. Jesus then fled to Japan, bringing with him a lock of hair from his mother Mary and one of Isakuri's ears. Jesus settled in Shingo, where he married a Japanese woman, had three daughters, lived as a rice farmer, travelled and continued to learn till he passed away at the age of 106. Well, that's a very interesting story, but it just contradicts everything that I've, that I've just said. If, but see, this is the thing. If Jesus did not rise from the dead and instead he went to Japan and lived there, there'd be no hope for our future because it's because he is alive that we do have hope and we know that all he said is true. Now, there may be someone here today uh, who doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Some of you may not know that your sins are forgiven. Uh, if so, you're like Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, your hope has no foundation. Well, the good news is that because of the resurrection of Jesus, you can have your sins forgiven. You can know the power of Jesus in your daily life. You can have a hope for your eternal destiny. Now, let me share with you how, briefly, uh, how you can do that, how you can have that hope that I and many other people in this room have. And it's quite simple. Uh, first, you must acknowledge that you are a sinner. You must recognise that your sin has offended the Almighty God. Uh, you must believe that your sin, it was your sin that sent Jesus to the cross, to die on that cross. The second thing is you must believe that Jesus died to pay for your sin. Uh, you must believe he paid for your sin. He paid for the full penalty of all your sins. And you must put your trust in Jesus alone for the gift of eternal life. And finally, third, you must confess your sin. Do this by asking God to forgive you of your sins. Uh, and you do that by repenting. Repenting just means to quit willfully sinning. Quit doing things that offend the almighty God. And you ask, how, may, how will I know that God's forgiven my sin? Well, the Bible says that God will give you an assurance that he has forgiven you. So I urge you, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and, and Saviour, you haven't asked him to forgive your sins, plead with God today for forgiveness until you know that you are sure that you have it. And if you need to know more about that, you can talk to either Damon or myself. Well, let's pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the resurrection. We thank you that, uh, that because of the resurrection, we know that we can have our sins forgiven, no matter what sin we have committed, no matter how heinous uh, it, it is or was. Lord, we thank you that uh, you, you did that for us. We thank you for the love that, that kept you on the cross. And uh, Lord... We thank you that through the resurrection, uh, you can give us power for living our lives daily, uh, give us, giving us the hope and give us the hope of a future better life where we will be able to live in a new world that's unbroken of all these things that are causing us troubles and strife, uh, where we can live in a new world and in new bodies. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.